Hello all. In this video, I'll be taking a look at these three router bits with replaceable carbide blades. These were kindly sent to me by Banggood, who have quite a few different types of these, all of which I requested, no harm in asking, but these are the three they sent. The first one I'll look at is this one, a two-bladed chamfer bit. This can be ordered with regular square blades for just chamfering, or, as I have here, as a two-in-one chamfer and roundover bit, turning the blade for different uses. Pretty neat. Next is this 60 degree V-groove cutter, single bladed. Not sure I've ever tried one as steep as 60 degrees before, so thought it worth a try. It could be used for V-grooves or chamfers depending on setup really. Lastly, I'll look at this beastie, a nylon 29mm diameter, 50mm long, 3 straight bladed flush trim cutter. I've got a few cutters around this size and weight, none with straight blades though. As you can see, if nothing else, it'd make an excellent maple snow machine. After giving them a look over and a few tests, I think it'll be worth briefly talking about router bits. In a fairly recent video by Peter Millard looking at this spiral carbide cutter, in which he questioned its legality regarding BSEN standards, I was struck by some of the comments. Lots of uncertainty regarding safety, longevity and legality. It's worth having a little talk about and maybe clearing up some of these uncertainties, so stick around for that. Let's kick off with this 2-in-1 roundover and chamfer bit. As I said, these are available with a square blade set only, making it just a chamfer bit, but this one has a cutaway for a roundover, 6mm I think, on opposing sides as well as two straight bladed sides. They sell these with 6mm, quarter inch and 8mm shanks, all in the 2-in-1 or single use variant. All of these Banggood cutters came with one of these Torx bits for removing or turning the blades. Turning is easy enough if a bit fiddly and, like all these type of bits, the body of the bit has a seat cut into it to perfectly align the blade when reinserting. And there you can see, with a turn of the cutter blade, we've gone from a roundover to a chamfer. With the cutter swap back to roundover, I give it a quick blast on some MDF here. Now MDF, I know, is not the toughest test for a cutter, but it's a good indicator of how clean a cut a bit is capable of. It'll quickly fur up on the edges with a dull or substandard cutter, much more so than solid wood. Here though, you can see the roundover, which I had set to its maximum, provides a nice clean edge, top and bottom. Not bad at all that. Here I've swapped the blades over to their straight edge for a chamfer cut. I should mention that this quarter inch shank bit is quite happy running at full chat on the little router. Lovely and smooth. Once again, in chamfer mode, the edges are nice and clean, no furring. Quite a handy little bit this 2-in-1, and with these carbide blades, you can rotate when they become dull to its opposing edge to continue cutting like it were new before splurging on new blades. Moving on to a few cuts with the 60 degree groove cutter. I've set out some marks on the board here as, as much for my own interest as anything really. I wanted to see if it had any potential doing starter bores which might be useful on laminates, pre-finished work or even aluminium. I'm still using MDF rather than those materials here to get used to the bit. I'll use the three different depths on the turret for each hole, the first being 2mm. One interesting thing I noticed straight away was that it's not happy running at full speed on the big Bosch router. You can see the base hovering around there from vibration. I knocked a third off the speed dial and it smoothed right out. Very surprising for what is quite a small compact router bit, but there's a good reason for it which I should have taken into account. I'll talk about that in a bit, but the second thing I noticed, in the scenario I have set up here at least, is how easy it was to spot the point of the cutter to the mark. I think, unlike the more typical 45 degree groove cutters, the steep 60 degree angle just means you're more easily able to eyeball where the point is. Not that free handing bores like this is practical for any actual work, but the point stands. Boom boom. So here's the three very clean starter bores. You might do something like this in laminate or alley to open up a marked or punched point, giving a drill bit to follow a clean and accurate start. These bits being available in half inch like here, 12mm, quarter inch and 6mm give scope for using this cutter in a CNC where this task is often best performed. Also some carving potential for its fine steep tip too. I've sat it in the router table here for a more common or garden routing task of chamfering, creating a beveled edge. It really doesn't seem to mind that I'm cutting to its full depth in one pass here. I probably could have knocked just a touch more off the speed to be honest, as it was still sounding a little buzzy, but a sharp, smooth cut nonetheless. And finally, its speciality cut, the groove. After finishing the cut, I realised I hadn't attached my vac hose. Always seems to be when I'm doing MDF, I swear. So I did this groove cut in one pass, about two thirds its full depth. It's not a bad cut, but I think this bit would benefit from a bulk cutting pass and then a slight finish pass to clean up. I think one and done deep cuts is a lot to ask from a single blade whose speed has needed to be dropped. The single blade does make for a really sharp point at the apex of the cut, mind. 
So why does this bit vibe out at high speeds then? Well, it's pretty simple, really. If you look at the two-in-one bit here, you'll see the cutter body is centered on the shank, whereas the groove cutter body is off-centered in order to have the blade point dead center to the shank. So a little speed moderation is in order to balance it out. Moving on to the monster flush trim bit. With such large bits, you have to knock off some speed before you start. I've knocked mine back to just below half. It's a lot of mass to spin at several thousand RPM. Starting on the router table with some 24mm MDF following a corner radius template. I'd normally saw off the bulk of the waste and use a flush trim for the finishing pass, but as this is a test, might as well see how it is at hogging out. Actually, it's not that good. It's very smooth and has very controlled nibbles for such a big bit. Clearly meant for finishing passes rather than material removal then. Unlike the lovely compression bits I've reviewed from Banggood before, which seem to love hogging out waste. I was a bit surprised by this, but I'd try it again on the opposite corner, this time pushing the bit a bit harder, but it just didn't want to round the corner in one pass like the compression bits are happy to do. With such a large bit, it's actually reassuring it resists in this way, and I'm wondering if it was designed in. It would give a hell of a kick if it got bogged down, so it might well be a feature. This is a leg set for one of my tables, assembled from a mishmash of rejected parts, hence why they look half finished, but fit poorly. They're in hard maple. I'm keeping them around in case I think of a use for them. As such, I'm happy to try the monster flush cut on them, see if I can't reduce that step on the outside radius to something sandable. Again, I'm struck by how moderate it feels on the cut. I have a more or less equally large compression bit that you have to be much more aware of how you're digging in. This three-bladed Banggood one just won't be pushed, meaning it's hard to dig it in, risking some sort of kickback. I think the shavings it's producing speaks to this as well, like maple snow. But it's swapped to do the radius on the other side of the legs now, and again, you can clearly see the step. I'd like to stress that a good practice when routing, much like planing, is to go with the grain as much as is practical. If I had these legs flipped over, so the router bit would come to bite into the end grain of that step first, you'd be asking for trouble. Thinking about your work like this is especially important if you're using such large bits in a handheld router setup like I'm using here. Here's a bunch of the maple snow the bit created. Considering the straight blades, they look a lot like the chips from my spiral block planer thicknesser, just a tad longer. Quite remarkable, really. The cut on the hardwood I'm really quite happy with. Not much to say about it other than it's clean. I look forward to trying it on a fresh joint rather than a half-finished, stitched-together one like this, which I can't really flush up properly without sanding. I have to say this has been the surprise router bit for me, in a good way. The last thing I was expecting to say was it felt reassuring in use, or that its cut was measured rather than aggressive. But here we are. Its cut in MDF was about as good as any straight bladed cutter. Spiral flush trim bits do the best job on MDF and ply in my experience. But yeah, very pleased with its cut on hardwood. Here's a comparable bit I've used for a while. A little larger diameter, but the same depth of cut at 50mm. But the blades on this one are angled for a compression cut, in effect cutting down slash up to give clean top and bottom edges. It can feel like an aggressive bit at times, and on top of that, it's really heavy. Stresses my 1600 watt Bosch router out, which the straight bladed Banggood cutter, being about a third lighter, doesn't. Also, you can flip the blades on the Banggood one, giving a brand new set of cutting edges, which should boost its longevity. But, there are no replacement blade sets available for it on Banggood. That's disappointing. At around £30 currently, it's less than half the price of this Rutland's large flush trim. So very good value anyway, but it could do with some replaceable blade sets being available. The 2-in-1 chamfer and roundover bit does have blade sets available, though only the 2-in-1s. If you wanted just a standard square cutter, then any 12 by one5 mm square carbide cutter will do. Not hard to find. So these bits sell for between 20 and 25 pound all in. A pack of 10 replacement blades also costs about 20 pounds. I think though, if you bought a pack of 10, this would pretty much be a tool for life. I really like these. The 60 degree bit is somewhat of an oddity compared to many of the replaceable blade cutters I've known, as the blade can't be flipped for a new cutting edge or anything. If you're interested in one of these bits, my advice would be to order a blade set with it. This type of blade aren't easy to find at all, and again, the bit sells for about £20 and a two pack of blades for about a tenner. It did its job perfectly well, but its advantages are few without buying extra blades with it. So, as I mentioned at the start, Peter Millard of 10 Minute Workshop recently bought up BSEN standards as it related to the router cutter he was reviewing. In particular, the cutter's blade projection. Is it safe? Is it legal? It's worth having a little look at, given that the woodworking industry, according to the HSE, has the highest incident rate of all manufacturing. Without getting bogged down in legalese, BSENs aren't the law or statute, but are in fact voluntary. 
the only exceptions being a couple of electrical fittings and safety signage. Other than that, they're more like code of best practice. Let's cite the HSE themselves. Following the guidance is not compulsory, unless specifically stated, and you are free to take other action. Their main caveat being, if you are prosecuted for breach of health and safety law, and it is proven that you did not follow the relevant provisions of the code, you will need to show that you have complied with the law in some other way, or a court will find you at fault. So, it's not the law, but following standards or code, you'll usually be doing enough to comply with the law if faced with litigation. But, more importantly, as it relates to woodworking, you'll be doing what you can to keep yourself and others safe while working. Alright, well what's up with blade projection then? I've done this rough CAD sketch to demonstrate the basic point. On the left is our cutter with an 18mm body and its blades projecting 1mm to make our cutter diameter 20mm overall. The block on the right there represents your workpiece as you're shoving it into the cutter. You can see the body holding the workpiece off, allowing for a maximum of a 1mm cut. The chip thickness is limited by the body. Now imagine that workpiece was a finger. It would certainly take your fingertip, but with such a shallow projection, the idea is it would only take a nibble before you pulled away instinctively. With a deeper projection of several mil, it'd be more likely to snatch your finger, causing a much greater injury. Also, a greater projection increases the risk of a cutter snatching your work and chucking it back at you. Sometimes, rather than a solid cylindrical body like I've just shown, a limiter will be designed into a cutter. The top image here, something like you might see on an old spindle moulder, has essentially a backward facing blade before the cutting edge. Not ideal, but it's still a limiter and would prevent horrific damage. Sometimes a limiter is a raised section before the blade, like in the lower image, not uncommon to many router bits. The same goes for a non-round cutter as shown here. It will still feature a raised part of the body. This large trend chamfer bit I have, a good example of that. What about the router bit that Peter was reviewing then? Well, I don't have the bit to hand, but this image off the sales website should suffice. I popped the image into CAD, and going off the known bearing diameter of 30mm, I measured the body that wraps in a spiral with the cutters. The body diameter measured around 28mm, ergo around 1mm of blade projection, so it seems a fairly well thought out bit, not only legal, but compliant, if, admittedly, like all these giant bits, a little intimidating. The large cutter I reviewed, despite how it looks, has a very shallow projection, the cutting edge just peeking over the body by 1mm. Okay, but what if a bit for a job had a blade projection greater than 1mm? What does the HSE mean by, you will need to show that you have complied with the law in some other way? Well, let's say our cutter with an aggressive projection is in a router table. You'd have to show that you've taken steps to keep fingers away from the cutter and reduce the chance of ejection. In practical terms then, ideally you'd fit feather boards to the fence and table along with a protective cover over the cutter. And or, to quote the HSE again, where the risk from use of work equipment cannot be adequately controlled by measures, such as guards or protection devices during its normal operation, it is particularly important that only the people whose task it is should be allowed to use such equipment. They should have received sufficient information, instruction and training. So, if the tooling is outside of code, take other precautions to facilitate safe use, including only allowing an experienced, well-trained operative to use it. Now most of you watching are probably hobbyist woodworkers and so none of this code and guidance really relates. That said, it will do no harm to remind yourself to be conscientious when you work. With regards to larger router cutters, whether handheld or table mounted, just take a minute to think. Drop the speed of your machine with larger bits as a standard practice. You can always notch it up a little for best cut, but you want to avoid the risks that come with larger cutters at full chat. Make sure to brace your work. As I mentioned, on a router table, if applicable, use feather boards, fences, stops and blade covers. If hand routing, clamp down the workpiece and pre-prepare somewhere clear to set down the router. If you can, take several passes if removing a lot of material or deep cutting. If templating, remove as much of the waste on the work beforehand with a saw of some sort, leaving the router cutter to do a clean up finishing pass. Sharp tooling is safer and gives better results. A good way to increase the longevity of your cutting edge is to clean your cutters. Oven cleaner is a pretty good bit and blade cleaner. Or a product like this CMT Formula 2050. Spray on, toothbrush off. Then a little spray with WD-40 to dispel any remaining fluids and prevent rust. Lastly, with regards replaceable blade cutters as featured in this video, I've read some concerns in comments about the screws coming loose or whether they last anything like as long as conventional fixed blade cutters. 
Well, I've been using this Tipman single bladed flute and this Fraser Tornado surfacing bit for a few years now, and they're used pretty regularly. My plane of thickness also has a spiral block with many small carbide blades. Never had a blade come loose. I do check periodically, and it's also worth checking screw tightness when you purchase a new bit, but none of mine have ever needed tightening upon checking. I've also not yet felt with any of these the need to turn the blades yet, so in terms of longevity, they're proving to be excellent. To end then, I'll just reiterate being conscientious with these sorts of cutters. It's rare you'd need something as large as the giant shown here to be honest, as you can often do the same job with a cutter half its size in two passes and be much more comfortable doing so. And so I hope despite the deviation from straight review into something a little more dry and technical, you found this video interesting. I'll leave all the relevant links to the Banggood bits in the description below if you want to take a look. Questions and comments welcome, like if you did, sub if you aren't already, and if you've made it this far, thanks for watching.